uh, when we look at you know what drives higher interest rates that obviously as those of us who are within the housing market ultimately end up feeling the pinch yeah th thanks for having me so when we talk about the influence of high interest rates on the property market in South Africa, you've sort of nailed it there. Nani Dumelang, good evening and welcome to episode 451 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamandongwa Kumalo. Now, tonight's conversation is one that I'm very excited about but for the wrong reasons. I think uh, I get excited about it because uh, we, we we know that when you're operating uh, in, in different fields, but property in particular, there are different macroeconomic factors that come into play uh, that you always need to be mindful of and certainly always need to get a grasp of because they have an impact on your home ownership journey or, or even on your home acquisition journey. And we saw that happen, of course, last week when the uh, Reserve Bank governor increased the repo rate uh, by uh, 25 basis points and we saw that now interest rates um, have increased uh, in South Africa meaning that you're paying more for your you know all the debt that you have you're effectively paying uh, more for it in terms of the interest that it is charged and we talk a lot about negotiating your interest rate and understanding of course that we, a lot of us are going to have a variable interest rate in our home loan and so you always want to get a sense of what, what exactly uh, informs how our interest rates even come about? What are the factors that lead to the SOP to even increase the interest rates? So we're going to be looking at the impact of you know the interest rates, the activity around it uh, on the housing market in South Africa, how it impacts you as a buyer, as a seller, um, and of course, if you're in the rental market and as a property investor, because I think the big thing is that property investors, this is an amount that eats into your bottom line. So if you're you know paying an extra 500 rands, for instance, on your home loan facility, it, it, it's eating into your bottom Line. So it's a question of did you adequately budget for it when you acquired your particular uh, property or you were literally budgeting on the tail end of things and counting on such variables not changing. I want to find out from you uh, certainly what you feel about the, 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 the increase in the interest rates. Did you budget for it? I think the big thing is did you budget for it? And if you're a new time buyer where you bought in the past two years, we experienced the historically low interest rates. Have had you budgeted for the increases? Uh, I think that's quite the big one because we, we want to make sure that when you bought at the lower end, uh, you are ready for the increases that we know are inevitable and we're already seeing them right now. So you let us know in the comments section and help us get a good sense of the impact of interest rates uh, and the different you know factor and geopolitical factors that happen not just in South Africa but in other parts of the world. I'm joined this evening by Marcel Dutoy, who's the CEO at Lead Home Properties. Marcel, good evening. Good evening and thank you so much for joining us on the show. Hi, good evening. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to to have you with us for the first time um, on the show, Marcel. I think the, the big starting point that I want us to explore is the the effect of the increasing interest rates, and obviously we know inflation is also on the rise on the overall housing market in South Africa. You know, what are those factors that come into play uh, when we look at you know what drives higher interest rates? That obviously, as those of us who are within the housing market, ultimately end up feeling the pinch. Yeah, th thanks for having me. So when we talk about the influence of high interest rates on the property market in South Africa, you sort of nailed it. That stuff. It's very much to do with cost and how much can you afford uh, as a consumer. Um, and obviously, when interest rates goes up, the cost of borrowing goes up, which, as you said, eats into your bottom line. The interest rate hike of 25 basis points that we saw uh, announced week was the third hike of 25 basis points in a row since uh, since November, which meant we've gone up from 7% prime interest to 7.75% in, in a matter of uh, you know, three, three or four months. Now, that in itself needs to also be seen in context of uh, a 10% prime interest rate that we had prior to COVID-19 um, and prior to the cuts in order to stimulate the economy. 
Um, so there's still a 2.25% uh, give uh, in the interest rate, uh, uh, current interest rate versus prior interest rate. However, the reality is that the Reserve Bank has indicated quite strongly that uh, we need to brace ourselves for what they call a normalization of interest rates. And all my economics buddies keep telling me, well, that means we're going back to 10%. And so I think as consumers, uh, when you talk about budgeting and you talk about how much can you spend on your mortgage, yeah, we really need to start thinking about what is that sustainable interest rate that you can afford your property on and what should you budget for. Um, and I'd strongly advise that as individuals, we look at somewhere between 9 and 10% prime, uh, given uh, you know, what the Reserve Bank has indicated. Uh, when, when we want to speak about the factors that influence uh, you know, the interest rate, clearly, uh, the biggest single one is inflation. Um, from, from a Reserve Bank uh, perspective, there's only a couple of tools in the arsenal that they can use to use to counter inflationary uh, pressures on the economy. And, and it also depends on whether inflation is perceived to be demand pool, which in, 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 you know, uh, in basic term means that people are earning more money and they're wanting to spend more money on goods. That's, for instance, what we've seen in the, in the US where the government underwrote uh, $2,000 for each person in the country. They then went and spent it on Amazon. That pushed up the prices on consumer goods. That's a demand pull sort of inflation because it means the demand for goods have gone up. That's sort of good inflationary pressure to have. And that is usually what you can manage quite easily with, uh, with interest rates. What we're seeing in South Africa is cost push inflation. That means that it's not because of the inherent growth in the South African economy or in inherent growth in wages and, and, uh, and, and money in South Africa or, the, or a supply of money in South Africa. It's because of things outside of our control um, that is pushing up our cost of living. And that, you know, as we've seen, and as you, uh, you know, as we'll discuss tonight, the war in Ukraine is having a huge impact on us. Um, the reality is, is that all price, prices have skyrocketed. Uh, when COVID hit, I think oil was down at $20 per barrel. It's now north of $100 per barrel. Uh, that's a significant increase. Um, and so those costs eat into every aspect of our life, uh, driving your kids to school, uh, transport to get uh, commodities from the mines to refineries, uh, agriculture, so, you know, getting goods uh, traveling across the country. And unfortunately, um, that those costs get passed on to consumers, including at a 15% plus, you know, plus 15% rate. So uh, cost push is really the worst of both of all worlds in terms of inflation pressures. And the, the main way that governments and reserve banks can deal with that is to put up interest rates. Uh, and so that's sort of where we find ourselves today is the Reserve Bank indicating that, that uh, increasing interest rates and getting back to normalized interest rate is their preferred method of countering this, this negative cost, cost push inflation. The offshoot of high interest rates obviously is a stronger currency. And we've seen that over the course of the last week. And a week ago, the RAND was trading at 15 RAND. 30 to the dollar. Today, the rand is trading at 49.50. And that's because anytime interest rates goes up, international investors are willing to move money from one geographic area to the other because they're chasing yield, yield being high interest on the money they, they, uh, they put in the country. So, um, you know, there's, 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 there's good as well, as, uh, but there's significantly more bad in the short to medium term for South African consumers. This evening, I'm in conversation with Marcel Tatoy, who is a CEO at Lead Home Properties, looking at the impact of the interest rates uh, and the interest rate activity on the housing market in South Africa. Of course, there are different factors that uh, have led to not only the decline, but certainly now the, the steady increase that we've been expecting uh, in terms of the interest rates. And we're going to be going through those you know, shortly. And of course, how you as a consumer can be best be 
best prepared and also how to navigate uh, those times because I think in as much as we've kept saying uh, you know rates went down quite significantly they are going to go up and they're not going to stay low uh, for an extended period of time we know that there's still quite a number of consumers who still got into either unsecured uh, debt or even went and acquired um, some properties but I think that's quite a big thing um, and all the, the the analysts and economists that I've heard speak you know talk about the importance for consumers to to buckle up and where you can pay down as much of your your debt as you can so if you've got any unsecured debt certainly pay that down and of course um, with your home loan facility if you can afford to try and put in extra um, in your home loan facility now Marcel you know one of the things that you mentioned of course was that uh, we've seen that the the the, cri- the, the Russia Ukraine um, crisis has certainly had an impact uh, not just on you know the housing market or interest rates but certainly uh, on other factors commodities markets the price of oil the price of wheat the price of flour and in in many ways uh, many of us across the world actually not just in South Africa are, are feeling the impact in different ways and in different shapes let's perhaps look at you know how geopolitical factors and some of these ma- macroeconomic factors do actually play a role in the interest rate that we ultimately get um, in South Africa. Because I know that with many South Africans, and I used to be like this before, uh, you know, before having the benefit of, of studying this stuff, but we always wonder where we even get these numbers. You know, I used to watch the, the Reserve Bank governor uh, when I was younger, and, and I think back then it was actually Mr. Mboweni, and we always wonder where do they get this. And I mean, obviously now with the benefit of having done applied macroeconomics and, and all sorts of other courses, I have a, a, a better understanding of, of why that is. But I think for the benefit of our viewers, how do these different geopolitical factors, macroeconomic factors, and even black swan events, I mean, we saw it in, in, in the onset of COVID, um, have an, an impact on the interest rate that ultimately gets charged locally and, of course, in other markets as well. It's crazy, right? I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> the world has changed so much. So we are all connected. Or we're all connected. No matter if you're sitting in Russia or if you're sitting in the US, the UK, or Germany or Zambia or wherever, we're all connected. Eh? A movement in climate in uh, Argentina has got an impact on our uh, grape um, yield in uh, and the prices we get in farm grape yields in South Africa. So the, the reality is, given the international trade market, we're all connected. And what happens in China affects us. What happens in the US affects us. South Africa's uh, trade relationships are mainly with the uh, with the Western countries or so-called the West, um, as opposed to the East. But notwithstanding anything that happens is an impact. And as you as you rightly know, you know the war in Ukraine pushes up oil, it pushes up your cost of driving to work or, or driving your kids to school. It drives up wheat prices. And unfortunately, that's just the, the, the way of the world. So we're not isolationist. We're, we, we're a globally connected uh, country and a globally connected world. Our Black Swan events is fascinating. And I think thinking back, I actually had a presentation to my whole company lead on this morning uh, because it's about two years ago exactly when uh, we were in lockdown. And Nobody saw it coming. I think the beginning of March 2020, we're sort of thinking about this thing called coronavirus and what are we going to do? And the reality is, it, it, you know, black swan events are out there and it's going to happen. Um, and so the question becomes, how do you incorporate that into your business model, right? And how do you incorporate that into trying to run a successful enterprise? And as a consumer, how do you incorporate that into your own budgets? And I think the biggest lesson of these black swan events is that you need to have Sort of a buffer whether it's as, as a as a private individual who's got a home loan and a family that you want to support or even you know even your just yourself you need to have a buffer so that when these black swan events um impacts interest rates you've still got a little bit of savings that you can you can dip into uh, obviously it helps to to have sort of a um a, a view that you can put away money every month even if it's as little as 100 grand it all starts building up um and so yeah i, I mean black swan events uh, is here. I think we've all learned a huge amount about how to uh, run a, a business. But I think importantly, one thing that nobody saw coming, and uh, you know, all I'm, 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 the viewers can tell me in the in the in the chat or the comments box if if anybody of them saw it coming. But certainly, nobody saw coming that COVID was actually going to have a hugely beneficial impact on um, on property prices. 
you know, what we saw uh, definitely after the first nine or, or ten week lockdown was that there was this built up demand and people um, had had sort of been cooped up in their houses and thought, you know what, I am going to go and invest in that property that I want to live in because now going forward, I want a study space. I need space for my children that they're not in my so in my room the whole time. I want fiber internet, and I really want to invest in making uh, my property not just a place to work, to live, but also a good place to work. So we saw a huge uh, um, sort of behavioral change in how uh, homeowners, existing homeowners, saw home ownership. So we saw a lot of selling, and moving. Uh, to to areas where, they, where people could afford larger prices, so a lot of semigration out of sort of the centre of Joburg into um, uh, into outlying areas like the West Rand or the East Rand, or even down to the, the South Coast. And and then I think what followed on from that was the significant drop in interest rates, which meant that suddenly you had all these first time, all these uh, 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 really good tenants who had really good credit scores. We sort of realized, oh, hold on, I don't want to be paying off somebody else's bond. I'd rather take my rental money and put it into my own bond and, and build up my own equity and my own wealth over time. So we saw the rental market go through a significant decline, as, as I'm sure you guys have, have seen and we've spoken about, um, where prices came under huge pressure and the first time buyers market booming. Uh, people being able to afford home loans and invest in property to invest in their own future. Um, so uh, these black swan events, it's fascinating. Um, I've certainly written down the notes so that one day when this happens again, I'll learn from the mistake I made in this time around. You know, Masal, I think the, the one thing we're hoping that uh, we don't get to experience another black swan event in our generation, um, although it doesn't seem like that will be the case. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of analysts saying that we're likely to have more pandemics. Uh, they're going to look slightly different, uh, but we almost need to buckle up. The, 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 the era of, I think, this generation, certainly this generation of, generation of millennials, we're going to be the generation that has experienced it all. So by the time a lot of millennials, you know, reach the you've likely been retrenched already you've gone through the housing crisis certainly the older millennials uh, you've also now gone through and are going through COVID and have had to navigate that um, and of course the financial implications of all of those so we, we are a unique generation in that sense we're having many lifetimes squeezed into a very short uh, period of time unfortunately now I, I want us myself to stay with this trend and and then look at um, what then does typically happen, uh, particularly in the housing market, whether it's even the rental housing market, the behavior of sellers and buyers in periods of low um, you know, interest rates and, and as they rapidly increase. So what kind of behavior do we typically see in the market uh, when we're in relatively similar, in a similar environment? And we already know we're going to get the, the increases. Where do we expect um, the behavior to go based on what we've seen in the past? I'll gladly talk to you, but I just want to comment on your comment around uh, seeing so much as a generation. I think what a phenomenal privilege is it for our generation to experience this? Um, not only did we go through the financial crisis in 2008-9, we've now gone through coronavirus. And there's significant lessons to be learned out of both of these Black Swan events. And the, the first lesson say is it's going to happen again it's going to happen in the next 10 years or 15 years but when it happens again make sure to buy equity at the bottom of the market right so make sure that you that you can do that as depending on the type of event understand the value of property as a primary asset and uh, and therefore make sure that you're in a, in a good position so I, I i look at it and i think of course it's been horrible and of course um you know, condolences to all everybody who's been affected by it. But I think from a financial perspective, a phenomenal opportunity to learn lessons for yourself and to start thinking about how, how do you make sure you're positioned in a way to take advantage of these market forces when the next Black Swan event happens. Just and then on the second part of your question around uh, buyer and seller behavior when in high and low interest rates environments, I think the first and most obvious thing is when when interest rates are low, uh, prices are higher. Um, 
And a very simple reason for that is because you're paying less as a buyer, you're paying less interest on the money you, you loan, the bank's willing to, to, to loan you more. So a very simple example is if you are gonna, if you've got 10,000 Rand um, free cash that you can apply to a bond after now your salary and your PAYE and your, your food and your petrol and all that stuff, let's say you've got 10,000 Rand. At, at a 7% prime interest rate, um, you know, that equates to around about a loan of 1.3 million Rand that you will get for paying 10,000 Rand a month. And so when you then have 1.3 million Rand, you are going to go to a, a homeowner and you can offer them 1.3 and then you, hopefully you'll transact that price. But at 7.75% that we, the prime interest rate that we are now at, for the same 10,000 Rand, I can only afford a house or a loan of 1.23 million Rand. So it's a 70,000 Rand differential over the course of a 20 year loan um, in terms of selling price, right? That I can afford to offer my seller. Now, that, that's again got, got two implications. One is that sales prices are going to come under pressure. I think over the course of the last two years, we have seen quite nice growth, uh, you know, somewhere between 4 and 6%, a little bit higher in, in different pockets in South Africa. But we've seen really nice price growth coming through, but that's going to come to an end as interest rates rise. When interest rates are higher, people can afford uh, less of a offer price uh, for the money and the free cash in the pocket. So that's the first thing, a low interest rate environment, high prices, high interest rate environment, lower prices. So that's from a buyer's perspective. From a, oh, it's both from a buyer and a seller's perspective. And then uh, the second thing is that people need to note is that obviously every person, as you as you noted earlier, needs to make their own sums and look at what's the, what's the differential between uh, lending money at different rates, right? If I've got an investment in call it, I don't know, a high yield bond or equities that's giving me 9% per, per year versus um, my home loan that's now giving 7.75%, it still makes sense to earn money in the 9% environment, can you get mm-hmm. earn one point more? But the reality is if, you, if you've got uh, cash sitting at a 2% uh, yield environment and you're not buying 7.75%, it makes sense to put that cash into into your um, your home land. So, um, you know, uh, we are a, we're in a challenging environment, but it's one that, mm. that teaches to think on our feet. Well, Marcel, that's where we're going to leave it this evening. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And that is Marcel Tatoy, who is the CEO at Lead Home Properties, wrapping up the Tuesday edition of the Private Property Podcast with myself, Fuzamantungwa Kumailo. It has been a pleasure to be with you this evening. We're back on your screens tomorrow at 7 p.m. Until then, hoping you're staying home and staying safe.